In section 6.4, we're going to take a look at exponential growth and decay. And you might recall this topic from previous math classes. And we're really going to kind of uh, just take a look at those kinds of problems again. Um, as you can see from this picture here, if you're not uh, familiar with these two graphs, uh, when you're dealing with exponent exponential growth and exponential decay, you're looking at these two uh, shapes right here. Um, the particular exponential functions for these graphs um, for the exponential growth here is 2 to the x power and for the exponential decay would be 2 to the negative x power. Uh, in general, um, exponential growth uh, could be any base, uh, but in this class we'll look at that same kind of shape where we have that, but you know it'll usually be uh, an e as a base. Uh, and then the same thing goes for the exponential decay. It'll still have that sh same shape, but the base we're probably going to be looking at is a base of e, and in this case it'll be e to the negative x. So definitely knowing that parent function shape for the exponential growth and decay is important, uh, no matter whether it's a base of e or some other uh, number as a base. So usually when dealing with exponential growth, um, a lot of the times we're dealing with population models. So, um, you know, maybe a certain way to look at a derivative uh, could be that it equals love. Now, I suppose uh, a derivative being equal to love can maybe only apply in the sense that population growth uh, is uh, occurring uh, when love is present, so to speak. Uh, but that's just kind of a silly way to look at it. Um, population growth uh, can be modeled with a separable differential equation, whether it's human population growth or really any population growth. Uh, so the way we're going to look at this particular separable differential equation uh, is with this uh, idea up here. If the rate of change of some population is proportional, and that's the key word, to some amount that you start with, change can be modeled by this separable differential equation. And the way we can translate this uh, differential equation um, is with the, these little uh, words here as uh, the arrows are indicating to what it uh, consists of. The dp dt, our derivative, is another way of saying the rate of change of p, which uh, usually stands for some population. Uh, that rate of change for p is, which is another way of saying equals, and that is proportional to the amount present. The key that's making this proportional is that k. k we call the proportionality constant. k is going to kind of be the key, um, without trying to make a pun, uh, k is going to be the key to making all of these problems work. If you can find what k is, these problems that we're about to look at should be pretty simple. So let's go ahead and try to solve this differential equation. We need to be able to separate the variables. So if we divide by p and multiply by dt, we're going to leave the constant on the right side. We've separated our variables. Once we do that, of course, we can integrate both sides. And don't let the p's throw you off. If it was dx over x or du over u, the integral of dp over p is the natural log of the absolute value of p. K is some constant we don't know. The integral of a constant with respect to time would be kt, and then we'll put the plus c on the right side. Uh, we, of course, need to exponentiate both sides. If you recall this back from 6.1 when we saw se separable differential equations, if you have a natural log that's trapping the p in this case, or y, back in 6.1, we need to first solve for y, or again, in this case, solve for p before we find c. So we need to exponentiate both sides. That'll mean we're just left with the absolute value of p on the left side. And on the right side, we can separate that power into two separate uh, factors, e to the kt times e to the c. If you recall, the reason we do that is so that we can call e to the c, this piece right here, recall, is just another way of saying c. e is just a number. And if you raise that number to another number, some constant, we just get another constant. Uh, the other thing we can do is drop the absolute value because, of course, populations can't be negative, so we don't need that absolute value. And I'm going to just write it in function notation by putting p of t because t uh, will be some time uh, that we're dealing with in these problems. Okay, so that is our general solution. If we want to find our particular solution, we need a point to plug in so we can find that value of c.
So usually we're going to be given information about how the population grows and that initial population size, which means then you can figure out an equation so that you can use that equation to predict the size of a population at any given time. So we have to start off with the assumption here that our initial population, will, which of course happens at time zero, is just some population which we'll call P0. So if we take that point and plug it in, P0 becomes our Y value, T is our X value, so to speak, so we'll plug that in for T. And if we solve for C, it's fairly simple because e to the 0 is 1. So C is that initial population, which gives us a very important equation we're all going to have to memorize. The population with respect to time is given by the equation where we take the initial population times e to the kt. The one thing you got to consider here with these problems that we're going to be looking at if, is that if growth is positive, or exponential growth is occurring, then k will be positive. If exponential decay is occurring, then k will be negative. So this is actually the only differential equation we're going to solve uh, with regards to doing 6.3 problems, these exponential growth and decay problems. Um, really what it comes down to is just memorizing this equation here, because any time we're dealing with these types of problems, this is the equation we're going to use. We don't have to solve this differential equation over and over and over because we know what the result's going to be. If we know the initial population, we can plug that in. And of course, like you were hearing me say before, k is the key. We have to find that k, and then we can basically do any of the problems that we're presented. Okay, so let's take a look at a few examples. And again, none of these are going to require any calculus steps. We know the equation we're dealing with if we're dealing with an exponential growth or decay. So I'll give you a second if you want to pause the video to read over this problem. But the key word that we're looking for in these problems is that word right there that I've underlined, proportional. Here, um, in this problem, we're dealing with bacteria that's growing proportionally, or I guess in this case, exponentially. So what's happening here? Well, we know we can start off with this equation. This problem wants us to figure out how many colonies there will be one after, uh, one hour after uh, the original 10 were planted. So once we have our equation, it shouldn't be too hard to figure that out. So what do we know from this problem? We know our initial population is the 10 that were uh, planted. We also know that after 15 minutes, the number of colonies had gone up to 35. So we can at least start off uh, by finding k. And to find k, we need to plug in two things. We need to plug in our initial population, which was 10. And we need to plug in some other data point that's given. And in this case, after 15 minutes, there were 35 colonies. If we divide by 10, we'll get 3.5. And now we're ready to solve for k. But since k is trapped up inside the power with a base of e, we know to get rid of that base of e, we need to take the natural log of both sides. If we take the natural log of 3.5, we just have ln of 3.5. And of course, on the right side, we're left with just 15k. To find k, nice and simple, we'll divide by 15, so that is our k value. So be careful when you're doing these problems, especially um, if they're not, in terms of the AP test, a multiple choice. We can't take this k value and just get the decimal for it. I know it's not really convenient to write a fraction up in the power, especially when it doesn't look like a nice fraction with that ln, but that's the way we're going to have to leave it, because we're looking for that exact answer. And if we round that k off, we're already making our approximation uh, at that step. Okay, so now that we know k, we can take that and plug it in, and now we have our population or our growth model equation. If we want to find the population after one hour, we can do that. But be careful. We're dealing with minutes, and that's how we found our k. Unfortunately, they tell us, as a sort of a trick maybe, uh, to find how many colonies there will be after one hour. So you might be tempted to plug in one, 
but since we're dealing with units of minutes originally, we need to plug in a value of 60, so we're looking for the population after 60 minutes. Now you can definitely use a calculator uh, to do this, and I definitely would recommend uh, you double check that you can type this correctly in your calculator. Um, you know, there's a few things going on here that could produce uh, a wrong uh, answer in your calculator if you're not sure how to type this exactly. So if you take the time to type this out correctly, it'll turn out that we'll have 1,500.63 colonies after one hour. So you can see exponential growth is kind of that. It grows very fast. Uh, we started with 10, and after just an hour, we're already up to 1,500 colonies. Okay, in this problem, it's kind of the same sort of uh, setup, uh, except we're asked uh, to find something different. So, again, the key word here that we're going to be looking for is that word there, proportional. It has to be a proportional growth, um, or a proportional rate, or this uh, equation that we've been using doesn't really apply. So, they tell us here that the initial population is 100 bacteria, and that this population doubles every 12 minutes. So, after 12 minutes, so P of 12, we should have double that population of 100 or 200. So before we answer any question, we have to find our uh, growth model equation. And again, the key to doing that is to find K. We can plug in our initial population of 100. And again, we can plug in our data point that we're given, where P of 12 equals 200. If we divide the 100 to the other side, we'll get 2. And just like every problem we're going to do, to find that K, since it's trapped up in that power, we need to take the natural log of both sides. After that, we can divide by the 12, and that's our k. Again, don't uh, or fight the temptation uh, to want to maybe get a decimal here for k and make it look a little bit easier to write. Uh, we're going to have to leave that k as ln 2 over 12, and that's our population growth model. So if we wanted to find the population after an hour and a half, we could do that. Uh, if we wanted to find the population after 42 minutes, we could do that. But that's not what we're asked to do in this problem, like the first example. In this problem, we want to find the time, how long, before there are a million in our colony here. Well, that's going to kind of be a sort of a reverse problem from the first example. In this case, we're not plugging in the time. We're setting our equation equal to 1 million and trying to find the time when it's equal to a million. So let's go ahead and go through that algebra. We can divide by 100, which would be 10,000, and then we can x. Oh, I'm sorry, we can take the natural log of both sides, and we'll end up with ln of 10,000 equals ln 2 over 12 times t. Uh, I didn't have a little space to fill in this step here, uh, but to find t, and again, you might want to attempt this in your calculator to make sure you can do this. Uh, we need to take that ln 2 over 12 and move it to the other side. I think you could divide by that fraction if you really wanted to, but I'm going to write it a little different. I'm going to instead multiply by the 12, which is in the bottom of the fraction, to the other side. So it'll be 12 ln of 10,000, and then we can divide by ln of 2. Either way, depending on how you approach this algebra, uh, when you do this math in your calculator, you should find the time that it takes uh, to get to a million in terms of this bacteria colony is 159.453 minutes. Okay, in this next example, um, if you take a moment to read it over and look at the information we're given, it doesn't use the key word I kept mentioning uh, in the first two examples and in that first slide where I explained um, this idea of exponential growth. We're looking for the word proportional, but they don't use it. And that's okay. As it turns out, we don't actually need the word proportional here. We know that this differential equation, as it's presented, is telling us that we're dealing with a proportional growth. Here, um, instead of P in this problem, uh, they're using Y. So we can say that the rate of change of Y is proportional to Y. That K is our proportionality constant. And when we multiply it by our um, variable or independent, I'm sorry, dependent variable Y, that would mean that we're dealing with a proportional growth, which means we're dealing with exponential growth.
The only difference is we're using y here, and they're telling us that y is equal to f of t over here. So we, of course, already know that if we're given this differential equation, dp over dt equals kp, we know the solution is this equation here. And we don't have to go through the calculus to figure that out again. So in this particular problem, I'm going to go ahead and change our equation that we've been using over to the f um, that we're given in this problem. So instead of p of t, it'll be f of t. And instead of p0, that would be f0. And then, of course, e to the kt. So based on the table that we're given, we know that f of 0 is equal to 4. And the one data point they give us, which will help us find k, is uh, f of 2 is equal to 12. So we can go ahead and write out our equation with our initial population, even though we're not dealing with population, I suppose, in this problem, uh, with our initial population plugged in a 4. And now we can use the point they give us of 2 comma 12 to find k. If we plug in our values, we can divide by the 4. And again, like the first two problems, our k is trapped in the power uh, of that e, so we can uh, take the natural log of both sides. To find k, one easy step of dividing by the 2, and we know the k is equal to ln3 over 2. So, a very, very straightforward problem. We weren't asked to find a value uh, like you saw in those uh, first two problems. We just wanted to find the equation or the expression for the original function given that proportional um, differential equation. Just note, we could have actually gone through the whole process of finding the antiderivative by uh, solving the separable differential equation. Uh, but again, the key here is identifying that this is one of these proportional differential equations, which gives us this exponential growth model. And then it was a very straightforward process after that. So our uh, solution here, or the expression we're looking for, is f of t equals 4 times e to the ln 3 over 2 t in that power. And that matches uh, answer choice uh, A. Okay, so I don't want to ignore the exponential decay uh, kind of problem, so we'll take a look at one of those examples. And then in addition to that, this problem is going to need a little bit of a different approach. But first things first, um, all of these problems that deal with exponential growth and decay don't always need to be a population, uh, so to speak, of some sort of biological uh, nature. Um, here we have a nail and a tire causing uh, air to leak out. And the key word here is the rate of change of the air pressure inside the tire is directly proportional to that pressure. At t equals zero, we know our pressure in our tire is 35 psi, and it's decreasing at a rate of 0.28 psi per so the first thing we need to do is write an equation that models the situation. And since we know we're dealing with exponential decay, we can go ahead and use our uh, growth model equation, or I guess decay model equation, really, uh, in this situation. We know our initial population, so to speak, is 35. And here's the key. They don't give us another point to plug in so that we can find k. So we're going to have to approach this a little different. All they tell us is that this rate is decreasing. So of course we know decreasing would mean we need a negative in front of that point 0.28. So dpt, dp dt is actually uh, equal to negative point 0.28. So how are we going to solve this problem? Well, let's at least start off with doing what's easy here and plugging in our p0, which is 35. So we need a way to find k. So instead of using our growth model equation, we're going to use the proportional differential equation to figure out what k is. We know that dp dt is equal to negative 0.28, so we can plug that in on the left side. We also know that p over from our equation over here is equal to 35 e to the kt, so we can also plug that in. That's kind of the two things we know that we can plug in here. So what are we going to do uh, from here on out? Well, the one little thing uh, you might realize is that if we plug in 0, that gave us our initial population of 35. So we can plug in uh, 0 for t. We know that as our one data point. So we know at 0, our initial population was 35. So of course, that just goes away 
and we're just left with 35 times k. To find our k, very simple, we can divide by 35, and now we have our k. So just take note, um, the difference between this example and the previous two slides is that we had to use our differential equation here to find our k, because that was the information that we were given. Once we have k, again, those are that's the key to solving this, these types of problems. We can take that and plug it in, and now we've done part A. We wrote our equation that models this situation. Okay, so in part B, what will the pressure be an hour after the tire was punctured? So the key here is that, uh, just like one of the problems you saw before, we're not going to plug in the number 1 for that one hour that we're trying to figure out. You'll notice up in the problem, we were dealing with minutes originally, pounds per square inch, PSI, per minute. So instead of plugging in 1, we need to realize that we need to plug in 60 instead, 60 minutes for that one hour. Once you realize that, it's just a matter of making sure you type this in very carefully in the calculator, and it turns out that the tire's pressure after those 60 minutes is 21.657 PSI, pounds per square inch. Okay, in this last example, we're going to take a look at another form of exponential decay in the form of radioactive decay. Um, so the decay of radioactive, sub radioactive substances can be modeled with an exponential function. And the key to kind of this uh, idea of radioactive decay is that radioactive substances uh, decay uh, over time, and that rate at which they decay determines what is called a half-life. All a half-life is, is just the amount of time required uh, for the decay of half of the atoms in a sample of a radioactive substance. So, you don't really need to know much about the science behind all of this. Uh, we're just going to apply this idea of uh, exponential decay to these types of problems, and to kind of help you understand half-life a little bit better, um, and the example we're going to use here is we're going to look at the uh, isotope radium-226, um, whose half-life is uh, 1,590 years. So just as an example, if we started off with a little glowing green glob of this uh, substance, if we waited 1,590 years, half of that would exist. And if we waited another 1,590 years, a half of that would exist. So that's kind of the idea. Um, if you have a certain amount of these radioactive substances, um, its half-life will determine uh, how long it takes for half of that sample that you have uh, to remain. So in this example here, uh, we want to determine how much of a 100 milligram sample of this radium-226 will be remaining after 75 years. So, nothing's really changed in terms of our approach to these problems. The only thing that needs to be pointed out here is that that k now in the power of the E needs to be negative uh, because this is a radioactive or a exponential decay problem. So, our initial population or the initial amount, so to speak, that we have here is 100 milligrams. So, we can plug that in for P0. And now to the k. Uh, the k in these particular problems, uh, we're not going to really go through the steps of solving uh, in terms of those other examples we did before. Uh, we're just going to note here that to find k, it's the natural log of 2 divided by the half-life of whatever radioactive substance you're looking at. So in this case, um, of course, our half-life is 1,590, so k is nice and easy to see uh, as negative ln of 2 over 1590. Okay, so that's our exponential decay uh, model, and we can use that to find how much of this substance we have at any time now. Uh, but in this particular problem, we want to know how much is left after 75 years. And the good news is the form that this equation is written in already is uh, taking into account years. So we can just take that 75 and plug it in. If you take the time to type that in your calculator very carefully, and again, pausing here and maybe practicing that to make sure uh, you're using your calculator correctly might be a good idea. But ultimately, if you type that in a calculator and evaluate it correctly, you'll find that there's going to be 96.783 milligrams left 
And that definitely makes sense. If it takes 1,590 years to have half of what you start with, then of course only after 75 years, there should still be relatively close uh, to uh, the 100 milligrams we started off with. Uh, so again, um, we're left with 96.783 milligrams after the 75 years.